All right, so today we're going to be doing another MO diagram from scratch, blank sheet of paper. Okay. And uh, this one will be different because it's not planar or linear. It will have to do the dashes and wedges. And so the pictures are going to be a little more complicated. So hopefully you can make this next step up in difficulty to see the P orbitals that are coming out at you and, and how they interact with the S orbitals and so on. Uh, this, um, this will be the most complicated one that we have to draw like from scratch ourselves, okay? Uh, recognizing ones, let's just go to the next. I've got a scratch sheet of paper here. Recognizing things like this. So if we have the ethene molecule, like we had on the homework, you know, all of these bonds are in the plane of the paper. And I was talking um, on office hours, like this, what we call the Sigma framework, where all the Sigma bonds are in the plane, plane of the paper. And we're talking about the, the pi bond. We know that pi bond is using uh, orbitals that are out of the plane of the paper. So if the Z axis is coming out here, and the X is here and the Y is there, by definition, that P orbital is the PZ, the unused PZ orbital, or atomic orbitals. And then they mix to form that pi bond. And so <clears throat> if, if you were to draw this um, pi bond, like it was required on the homework, you would draw it like this, where you have the shading kind of in front and back. So that might be, I would say, maybe the, the, more, the most complicated one. The ones we're doing today are probably not this complicated. Um, sometimes it may help if you're doing this by yourself, if you wanted to draw the dashes and wedges, so just turn that molecule sideways, then you can more easily see that pi bond. So now I've rotated this thing completely 90 degrees. Now the Z axis is going up. Does everybody see how it's rotated around the X axis? And now that Y axis was going up. So I'm going to draw it going back into the paper. So the Y axis is flipped down. Now it's going away from us. And then you can see those, those P atomic orbitals. <clears throat> and the way I drew them up there, the, the shaded region was in back. So if I rotated it, now it's down. And then, so that would be the pi bond. So both of these are pi bonds. Uh, we could have done the, the same thing to draw the pi star bond, uh, the, the antibonding orbital. So I'm just going to draw that one over here, just to draw the. So there's a carbon in the middle, and then this one comes up, and the top is shaded. So you should be very comfortable with this now. So that's the pi star. Um, looking at the coordinate system, What do we have? We have, uh, in this case, notice that pattern of plus, minus, plus, minus is in the XZ plane. So there's the Z axis here, the X axis here. And so that is X times Z. So when they're written like this, that's X times Z, okay? And that you would get those that pattern. So these are the kinds of things you should recognize with orbitals. If you're given a complicated molecule like this with a molecular orbital on it, uh, you should be able to say that this contributes to a particular bond. Like in this case, this is a bonding orbital for the carbon-carbon bond. It's a pi bond between the carbon and carbon. It's not really contributing to the hydrogens at all. Here, this one, because this node is breaking that carbon-carbon bond, it's antibonding for the carbon-carbon. It's non-bonding for the CH. Uh, let's, let me just draw one more, and then we can go to the pH3 uh, uh, MO diagram. Let's work in the sigma framework. If I draw the 2S on the carbon in phase with these hydrogen 1Ss, I get something like this. And then these are, say, out of phase with the other side of the molecule. <clears throat> so looking at that, at that particular molecular orbital, can you see that it's not so easy to assign this as a, a star or, or a non-star, like a, a sigma or pi or a star or non-star, bonding, antibonding? Because there's a node right here 
that breaks the carbon-carbon bond. And so you could say, if you were given some options, anti-bonding for the carbon-carbon, okay, but bonding for CH. And that's, that's pretty much what I want you to be able to do. If I give you a, a, a really complicated MO, in, in your estimation, a complicated looking one like this one in the upper right, you should be able to look at it and say, okay, the node breaks the carbon-carbon bond, so that's antibonding for carbon-carbon. And then the lobes, the, where the, the shading or non-shading region is, envelops the CH bonds, so that's bonding for CH. Because remember, these, these, uh, these expanding and contracting parts of this MO are where the electrons are. If we were to square that, all those positives and negatives would be positive and that's the probability distribution. So that's where the electrons are. There are no electrons between the carbon and carbon, but there are electrons surrounding the carbon hydrogen, and that's gonna help hold those nuclei together. So it's bonding for the CHs, but not bonding or antibonding for the CC. Okay, so that's about as complicated as it gets. I want you to be able to look at an MO, analyze it, tell me what it's doing, okay? But then for the MO diagrams, I want you to be able to draw these. So pH3, let's draw that molecule in the middle. Let's draw our z-axis up. So this is z going up, x, y. And so we'll put our phosphorus in the middle. <clears throat> so we're just doing the Lewis dot structure. And I'm trying to draw it as um, those hydrogens kind of right in front of each other because they should, you know, if we're looking at this molecule sort of uh, side on, those hydrogens are pretty close to each other from our perspective. Okay. So we need to break this molecule into two pieces by symmetry, right? So the hydrogens are all similar, right? They have the same... Uh, symmetry if you were to rotate them the hydrogens are all connected so they go to the left or the right doesn't matter so let's take the hydrogens to the left and the phosphorus to the right and then we're going to create the mo diagram by combining the atomic orbitals on phosphorus with the symmetry adapted linear combinations of the hydrogens okay so over here essentially we have the um the h3 part let's do p over here so we can have p and h3 so just like the molecule p h H3. So we're making this molecule out of a phosphorus and three hydrogens. And this is a C3V molecule. So let's go get the character table. Let's keep those. So let me find that. In the notes. So here's our C3B character table. Copy that, we'll paste it here. So we can go back and forth to refer to that. Let's go get the direct product table while we're there. Down at the bottom of your little, this will be your little handout packet. Um, Okay, so this, uh, it, notice this direct product table has a whole lot of point groups associated with it. C3V is one of them. But some of those point groups have G's and U's, and so that's why they save, they, the way they save paper is they'll have, um, uh, they'll have the character table that deals with the A1s, A2s, and B1s, and E1s, and all of that stuff. And then the, if it has G's and U's, you do those separately. That way they don't have to make the same table twice and just put G's and U's on everything. So, so there's our character table and our direct product table. And C3V. So what we want to do is we want to assign the atomic orbitals that we're going to make using the Millikan notations. Now we did this with the projection operator for the hydrogens. 
And so let's go ahead and, and do that. If we went and looked at that projection operator video, down here, low in energy, would be this particular picture, where they're all in phase. So I'm just going to draw them all with the same shade. So these are the 1s orbitals on hydrogen. They're all in phase. And that was going to be that top row designation. So if we go to the character table, we see that top row is A1. And that has this sort of uh, all those 1s's are in phase. There's no nodes. So if you look in the z direction, the y direction, or x direction, they're all going to be squared. There's no negative signs anywhere. So that's going to be um, like a z squared type a situation, an x squared and a y squared, and so that'll be A1. So this one's going to be listed as A1. I'll just draw an energy level there and call it A1. Okay, so that's easy, and we knew from the projection operator it was A1 because we used that top row to produce this picture. If we rotate it around and reflect it through and do all of those things, uh, we had plus ones everywhere. So there was never a time when that, that uh, unshaded uh, sphere would turn shaded because there were no minus ones on that row. However, up here we have two degenerate uh, levels, the X and the Y. So one of those was X, the other one was Y. But there are no P orbitals, so these aren't the PX and PY. These are the, um, the projection operator symmetry adapted linear combination. So I'm going to go ahead and write this up here just so that you um, it reinforces it. So symmetry adapted linear combinations of the atomic orbitals. It's really long uh, initialism. So, so these are the SALC AOs for these three hydrogens. The symmetry adapted part is we're taking the combination of the atomic orbitals and we're adapting them with symmetry and making linear combinations of them. So we're we're making the pluses and minuses. So let's go with the uh, with the Y picture. When we did the Y picture, that was the one that if we label these hydrogens up here. Um, Let's, let's do it right here, we'll say. We'll draw these three here and we'll label them A, B, and C, right? So uh, let's just call this one A. And B and C. Okay, so starting on the right, going clockwise around, looking down. And so this one was the 2-1-S-A um, minus 1sb minus 1s, oh goodness. If you missed that lecture, you have no idea what I'm doing, okay? But this is twice the size on the 1sA, and then it's out of phase, a different shading than the 1sB and the 1sC. So I'm going to draw that picture right here. So on this hydrogen 1sA, we have a huge circle. And that's on HA and on HB we have a regular size circle but it's going to be shaded and then behind us we have that HC and it's got a regular size circle and it's shaded and you notice how this motion if those are expanding and contracting is along the y-axis so that's the y Now, since we use the 1s orbital on atom A uh, twice, essentially, in this one, then the other one is not used at all. And so we'll just draw a stick, but no orbital on it. And we'll draw the wedge here and the dash behind it. And one of these will be unshaded, the other will be shaded. And so I'll just shade the one in the back. And so that's the 1sb minus 1sc. And that's the X one. Both of these are degenerate. And so that's going to be an E motion. Let's make sure that matches our character table. Yeah, E. There's no E1 or E2. It's just E in the C3V character table. So those are our symmetry adapted linear combinations of the three atomic orbitals on the hydrogens. So we have three hydrogen 1s's. We come in, we have three symmetry adapted linear combinations. 
They're not quite MOs yet, so we can't say we come in with three atomic orbitals, we have three MOs, because these are not MOs yet. They're just SALC, AOs. They're symmetry adapted linear combinations. But we're done with the H3 part. And you can see how now these things will probably mix with the P orbitals, and they will, according to symmetry. So the A1s will mix, and the E's will mix, and, and so that's what we'll have. So over here, this will be easy. Uh, let's go ahead and do the, the top ones, the hydrogen, the highest occupier, the highest orbitals on the hydrogens will be right across from the P orbitals on the phosphorus. Let's go ahead and I'm going to do this in, uh, in sort of reverse order. So I'm going to put the Z on the left and then the Y and then the X. And it's, there's no real big deal with that. I wouldn't count off, but I just it'll make the picture look a little prettier. And then down here, I'm going to put the 2S. Nope, it's not 2. Where are we? Phosphorus? 3. Thank you. Okay. Thank you to my brain. Right. 3S. I would count off for that. Okay, and these are the, these right here are the 3P orbitals. Now, where are the 2P? And the 2s and the 1s on phosphorus, yeah, they're core electrons. So the 2p, 2s, and 1s core is down there somewhere in energy. Doesn't interact in the bonding. All right. So then the s orbital on phosphorus is pretty easy to draw. We we'll just draw a phosphorus with a circle around it. Um, the pz goes up and down. The PY is sideways like this. And then the PX has that lobe in front and then one that's in the back that's shaded. Okay. So you can see that PX, PY, PZ following our, our Cartesian symmetries. And so these are the atomic orbitals on the phosphorus. Now, hopefully you're looking at this and you're not just following along with me, but that you're uh, that you're thinking, okay, what would we do next? What would we do next? Okay, let's label the symmetries of these. So what is this uh, 3s orbital, the symmetry on the 3s? A1. Yeah, A1. What about the PZ? Let's go ahead and look at our character table. So here's the PZ right here. And then the PX and PY are gonna be E. So let's go ahead and label those. So the PZ is A1. And then this group here is E. To be honest, I think it's easiest to mix the E's. Okay, so let's just mix the, the E's, this XY and that XY, so the X mixes with the X. You see this, um, let's just draw a line down here to this level here. Let's go ahead and make these uh, doubly degenerate. I think they will be, since they're E. We're going to mix two E's and we're going to get, we're going to get, I guess, four E levels and get four E levels out. So there's our, our E bonding and antibonding, if you want to think about it that way, or in phase and out of phase combinations. Notice the X and the X will mix just like this. So we're going to have that phosphorus in the middle. Let's go ahead and draw our molecule. And that lobe on that phosphorus, the PX orbital, we'll draw that one with the shading in the back. And then this front hydrogen is unshaded and that back hydrogen is shaded. <clears throat> and so that's bonding for the pH bond, right? It's non-bonding for the pHA bond, it's bonding for the pHB and the pHC. We might, later on, if there's time, we'll draw this from the top down, and then you might be able to see it easier. Uh, let's go ahead and draw the antibonding version of that. So here's P, H, H. Remember early on in the class when I said, you gotta be really good at drawing. So here, this front hydrogen now is shaded. 
and then the back hydrogen is not. And so that's antibonding for the pH bond. So the pHB antibonding and the pHC antibonding. <clears throat> okay. Now let's draw the, the, the Y versions of these. So. so this is the PY, and so it's coming out this side and that side. And then this hydrogen in front has got sort of twice the volume. And the back side of this P orbital is shaded, and so are those two hydrogens. So the HB and HC are shaded. And so this molecule has just a node down the middle separating the negative y-axis from the positive y-axis, and it's bonding in all three bonds. Okay. And then up here, we'll draw the antibonding component of that. So you draw your P orbital, shade the back side, and now you just reverse all of the shadings on the hydrogens. So this is shaded here, unshaded there, and unshaded there. And so we got nodes everywhere on this one. And so that's going to be antibonding for the pH bonds. And those are E. So this one is E up here, and this one is E down here. Any questions on those? Yes. Um, the, for the, your two antibodies, um, you always left out that one H, but then you did circle it with an orbital on the other ones? On yes, the just like over here, see I'm using that, that A, the HA, twice in the Y one, and zero times in the X one. And so it doesn't even have a, oh, you're seeing this circle here, yeah, excellent. No, 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 that's right. No. Uh, it was, no, see here, there's no circle on this one or that one. And that was the, um, that was this one here. You see there's no, Circle. I could draw an H there, yeah, but there's no circle on it. And the best answer I have is that we conserve the number of times we use each orbital. So each 1S on all the hydrogens is used um, three times. It's used once in the A1 and two times in the other, but here it's used two times in the Y and zero times in the X. Whereas the, the orbital on atom B is used once here, once there, and once there. Just mathematically. That's, it's just a mathematical reason for that. And, and also, if I have a node going this way along the XZ plane, if I rotate that node 90 degrees, it cuts across that hydrogen. And so I can't put a, a S orbital on a node because how could it be negative on one side and positive on the other? It's an S orbital. So it kind of just destroys that S orbital. We can't use it if it's sitting on a node. Yeah. Uh, what's the reason that you decided for the antibody? Yeah, they look pretty complicated, but uh, this is such a um, symmetric molecule that they, look how many things are on that row for E. So like even if they went from XY to like XZYZ, they're still on the same row. I was talking about the, towards the XYZ. Yeah, the Cartesian symmetries. Yeah. So. This one is um, this one is clearly X because the front is different than the back. Okay, so that would be X. Got that one. This would clearly be Y. Okay, these up here. Hmm. I'm not sure um, because you're you're standing on the center of the mat on center mass. Um, you're, you're looking in the X direction, and they change sign when you look in negative X. And so I think there's still an X component. Um, yeah, I would I would still keep them as X and Y. Like if you were to put X and Y here, I couldn't argue against you. Okay. This one, if you're standing on the center mass, you look in the Y, you see this pattern of unshaded and then shaded, and you look in negative Y and the pattern's reversed. It's now shaded and unshaded going away from you. And so um, I would call that one Y as well. Um, 
Yeah. So I would I would say that these are still X Y in terms of Cartesian symmetry. You would, you know, the one would be X and No, because there's really no change in Z up and down. So if I'm standing on the center mass here, I look up and down. Um, there's no change in sign going from up to down, and so it would. Um, yeah, I wouldn't put I wouldn't put the Z part on there. Yes. Uh, what about Y? Looking the Y direction on the X, the one you labeled the X. Yeah. Um, so where was where does X Y show up? X Y shows up on the same row. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. So this, if looking down, this kind of has that plus minus plus minus pattern on this one. Um, the companion to that would be the uh, x squared minus y squared. So. I don't really see that if I'm looking down. No, that's a really good question, and I've never really thought in the threefold system of, of pulling those out. It's really very obvious when you have those pi bonds that you go from a pi, a pi bond, and the x direction is x, and then when you go to the um, pi star, then it's the x times the z, you know, in the diatomics. It's always that way, um, but in this one, it doesn't seem to be a, that clear. So no, no, no. I mean, I, look how long it's taken me to, to answer it, you know, in terms of trying to figure out whether those uh, antibonding orbitals, what their Cartesian symmetry is. Yeah, so I wouldn't do that. Yeah, we'll just leave it as E. Yeah, yeah. But that's a really good question because it, you know, again, it raises that discussion about what, how would you determine those symmetries? All right, so we brought in the, the X and Y on both of our groups, our, our phosphorus atom and our symmetry adapted linear combinations on the hydrogens and we made the two or the four E uh, molecular orbitals. Now let's bring in our three A1s and this one is where it's a uh, it's a little confusing in terms of where that node goes on the P orbital. So we have to have three orbitals. It's real tempting to just have um, you know these this A1 interact with the um, the three S and make a, a bonding and an antibonding, and then what are you going to do with the PZ? Are you going to mix that A1 with the PZ and come up with a bonding and antibonding? If you do that, you have four molecular orbitals. And so you can't do that. You can only have three in the result. And so we're going to have one down here, one in the middle, and one up here. And so we've got to think about the pictures that we draw for those three. Okay. Now the bottom picture is super easy. Okay, the bottom picture is super easy because everything's in phase. We have a 2s and three 1s's on the hydrogens, and so we have our molecule. And our, we can just draw circles around everything and no shading at all. Everything's in phase. And now I find it easiest to just mix the, the A1 on the hydrogens with this PZ in phase and out of phase. And so let's, let's draw that picture. We'll draw it here. So we're drawing the PZ on the phosphorus. And we're going to shade the hydrogens this time because we want them to be in, in phase with the bottom side of that PZ. Okay, so that's the bonding one. All the hydrogens are in phase with the bottom side of that PZ orbital. And so then up here will be the one that's antibonding. So we draw that PZ orbital on the phosphorus. We shade the bottom, and then now our hydrogens are unshaded. And that's all of them. That's all our pictures. These all three are A1. A1, A1, and A1. Um, all three of these, well, the top two are Z. 
So this one is Z, this top one up here is Z, because it's using that PZ orbital. And then down here, um, it's A1 because it's X squared, Y squared, Z squared. So. So those are all of our pictures. Uh, let's add up our electrons. Oh, but before I do that, let's ask ask questions or if there's any questions on the pictures. Yes. I can draw the shading lines to uh, Okay, yes. So this A1 is mostly mixing with this one down here, but we'll go ahead and connect it to all three. Oh, no, I should say, no, this is, yeah, strongly connected to all three. So I'm going behind everything, you see that? Okay, and then this, uh, this the 3S that's strongly connected to this one down here. And you say, well, is that 3S connected to this one? Because there's a node going through that phosphorus. If I mix this 3S in a little bit, it just shifts that node. That 3S is gonna either interact with the top half of the PZ or the bottom half of the PZ. And it's gonna shift it up or down. So that node may go below the phosphorus. If I mix it in, uh, in phase with the top part of that PZ or shift that node above the phosphorus. And so it's interacting with these two as well. Okay. Good questions. Let's do our electrons. So how many valence electrons do we have in the phosphorus? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so there's our five valence electrons. Um, the symmetry adapted linear combinations, since that never exists by itself, it probably doesn't have, uh, you know, like isn't populated with electrons, but we can do that anyway. We come in with three electrons, three 1s orbitals. And so we've got one, two, three, but, but scientifically or, or like realistically, that doesn't make a lot of sense to put electrons on the symmetry adapted linear combination side, but let's do it anyway as sort of a useful fiction because then we can keep track of all of our electrons. Um, and so we have five, six, seven, eight, eight total electrons. So we just start from the bottom. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now look, if we had six, it'd be paramagnetic, okay? and a triplet, okay? So if we had pH three, two plus, we'd be done. Okay, but we have pH three, so we'll go ahead and do seven and eight. All right. And that's a pretty, well, we can do the highest occupied molecular orbital and lowest occupied molecular orbitals, we'll do those. Okay. So this, this is the HOMO here and the LUMO. Isn't this fun? For me at least. Okay. And so then we can figure out what, you know, what light would c cause a transition from the HOMO to the LUMO using the symmetry depth, I mean, using the uh, transition dipole moment integrals and so on. And we can do that in a second. I just want to make sure I answer your questions on this. Uh, I won't ask you this because I don't even know how to calculate. What's the bond order? There are no stars. There's no anti-star, you know, no, no, no non-starred, <laughs> right? There's no sigma. There's no pi. Um, yeah. So once you, once you get away from a diatomic, those kinds of things um, aren't as useful anymore. But we could look at all of these pictures and say, all right, what bonds does this molecular orbital contribute to? See down here, this one contributes to all three bonds. Okay, so this is bonding for all pH bonds. This one contributes to all three. Uh, this one contributes to one of the pHs in front, that one contributes to the pH in the back, but it doesn't contribute to the one on the right. Um, this one contributes to all three, okay? So, I mean, it looks almost like we have four bonding here because they're contributing to all four bonds. We don't have anything that would, would weaken those bonds at all. Okay. So that's what we have. 
It's, you know, those are the molecular orbitals. Uh, why do we believe this? Well, because of the X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. So how many peaks would we predict in the UVPS or X-ray PS? Three, right? Because we have three energy levels. This, this E level would be degenerate. So that would be all under one peak. And so if we hit this with X-rays, we should expect three peaks. Uh, to come out in the in the valence band, the valence band of peaks. So you'll have the three peaks from the valence band, and then if you keep going, you'll see the 2p orbitals on the phosphorus, the 2s orbitals on the phosphorus, and the 1s orbitals on the phosphorus. But when I say valence band, UVPS, uh, that's what we're talking about. It's just those orbitals in the molecular orbital diagram. Yes? Um, our orbitals, like the orbitals that are all in phase, could we just draw as if one big thing was that? Yes, you could. So let's let's draw one of those. I think I know what you're talking about. So if we were to draw that phosphorus here, it uh, the reason I was um, drawing it the way I was drawing it just is to make it um, obvious that which atomic orbitals were were being used. Okay, does that make sense? So that you could see, I was drawing the S orbitals on the hydrogens and the P uh, orbitals on the phosphorus. But you could draw this one for the P Y, uh, so the three P Y plus the two one S A minus one S B minus one S C. So notice now I've mixed in the the phosphorus orbitals. In there, and it's in it's in phase with this. I want to put it put a plus sign in front of that, and so that's going to show you that this is in phase with this symmetry adapted linear combination. That's that would be the shorthand that I would write for that one. Now, if I give you one of these that talks about the shorthand, you know some of the other options that would be wrong. Um, I'm going to make them clearly wrong. Okay, I'm not going to give you like uh, I wouldn't ask you to choose between this one and the three p y minus the two one s a um, plus one s uh, b uh, plus one s c because you know you you could you could argue you could get into an argument with me on whether this is also you know valid for that one what i would do is i would com i would have you compare this shorthand to like the 3 pz obviously wrong right the pz is going up and down and and if i put in a plus 2 1sa minus 1sb minus 1sc you would say okay well I see the 1SA, if I had these labeled, to make it easier, okay? I see that that's this piece, okay? And so that, you know, that might be one of the answers, but then I look at this and I see the 3PZ and I say, no, it's not the 3PZ interacting in that manner. The 3PZ goes up and down. And so that's what I say is obviously wrong. That one's obviously wrong, okay? Um, Another one obviously wrong would be if it was that same orbital, um, if I wrote the um, 3s plus the 2, 1s, a, dot, 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 right? This is not an s orbital on the phosphorus. There's a node that breaks right through it, and so that's not the s orbital on the phosphorus. That's a p orbital on the phosphorus because there's a node that goes through the phosphorus. But those, that would be what I would consider that like, A-level difficulty, you know. <laughs> and so that would be a tricky question. You know, you have to actually understand what that little shorthand is talking about. But if you do get it, hey, that's another three points, you know. Um, let's see. Let's do the homotolumo transition. So we have... Um, We have the choices of X, Y, or Z light. We have the highest occupied molecular orbital. So we can set up the transition dipole moment integral like this and then put in all the pieces. So let's do, um, let's do Z first. It'll be a simpler one. And then Z here is A1.
anything times a1 is itself. And then anything times itself is going to contain a1. If we can, let's go ahead, just so that you get familiar with it, go back to the direct product table. Um, I've got B's in here and stuff. Don't let that confuse you. You don't have any B's in your in your character table, so just ignore them. We're talking about the E, so I have an E times an E, and I'm going to get A1 plus A2 plus E. Now, it says E2, but I don't have any 1s or 2s in here. So just ignore the 1s and 2s on my E's. It's just A1 plus A2 plus E. And I'd like to see that. I, I know that I already have the answer with the A1, but go ahead and write it out. Because what you're trying to do is prove to me you know what you're doing. It's not just about getting the right answer, it's about communication. I want to know that you know what you're talking about. And so since this has got an A1, which is top row, this is not equal to zero. Therefore allowed. So that's allowed for Z polarized light. Okay, let's do the same thing with the XY polarized light, E, E, and E. So this one is now down here. So E times E gives us that set A1 plus a2 plus E, and then I'm multiplying that by another E. And so I'm going to go ahead and write these out. Uh, e times A1 gives E. I believe E times A2 gives E. So let's go back and look. I have an A2 here. Yeah, times the E, it just gives E. So E times A2 gives an E. And then now we know E times E is A1 plus A2 plus E. And so here's our A1, buried right in the middle. So this ought to be a strong transition, <laughs> okay? Now we don't know if it's in the visible region or not because we don't actually have numbers on our energy levels. But if we did, we could look to see if pH three is colored, right? If that homo to lumo transition, which is the longest wavelength transition, is in the visible region, then we would have a chromophore. We would have something that creates a, a, a you know, a non-transparent visible spectrum. We would see uh, some sort of color change. And, uh, and so, you know, if you're given that energy level, if it has numbers on there and you're asked, is this a colored compound? I mean, can you cut, convert that energy difference to wavelength, right? So, at, you know, using Planck's law, you know, they've got a delta E is equal to H nu. What's nu? <laughs> C over lambda, thank you very much. <laughs> C over lambda. And so you got all your constants here. If you know what the delta E, you can solve for a wavelength. And, and then uh, make sure you use the correct uh, units so that you get nanometers, and that's the visible region. And if it's 3,000 nanometers or something, then it's way out in the infrared. If it's, if it's 150 nanometers, it's in the UV. So where's the visible range? 400. Yeah, y'all did the RGB lab. 400 to 700, yeah. Yeah, so that's that's about that's about all I can ask you guys. We only got three minutes left. I mean, this is uh, pretty pretty cool. I mean, hopefully, when you you know, could you have done this in August? No. All right. So you've learned something. So when it comes time, when you're doing the idea stuff, uh, filling out your survey, you're comparing your knowledge to August. You're not. It's not a popularity contest. You know. <laughs> so you just say. Do I know more now than I did then? <laughs> and I think if you can do this,
you know more now than you did then. So great. Y'all have a good day. <laughs>